Welcome to the Citizens Report. It's the 4th of December. I'm Robert Barwick. I'm joined today by Citizens Party founder and leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. In this week's Citizens Report, victory for people power in the war on cash and fight for the win-win solution in Australia Post Bank. But Craig, we get to declare victory. Robbie, we'll be opening the champagne bottles right now, but it's only very early in the morning, so we better not do yeah, that. Yeah, we better not do that. We'll, we'll put um, fake animation on the screen or something. Yeah. But we are actually, we're, full disclosure, we're going to have a party tonight. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, this is really worth celebrating because it's a celebration of not just our work, but in fact, the, the work of thousands of people around the country. Exactly. Now, but Craig, let's, let's um, maintain the suspense on that. We've got a bit of bad news first. It's not really bad news. Um, we're going to announce some good news on the war on cash. But first, we have to up the, update the viewer on bail-in because bail-in has our, been, been our focus for such a long time and the other big news was that this week um, on monday of this week this is now friday uh, the banking amendment deposits bill 2020 that had been introduced by senator malcolm roberts which the citizens party drafted for him uh, was voted on now this is significantly this is quite a milestone in itself because of all the bills we've put into parliament from outside parliament craig we've had four now this is the first one to come to a vote Robbie, so this bill, what this bill was, or what Senator Roberts' amendment was, was to clarify the legislation that was rammed through the Parliament by stealth in, uh, on the 14th of February 2018, yes. which actually brought bail-in into this country. Now, the government says, oh, no, 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 we didn't, no, there's nothing in there that says we're going to bail in people's deposits. That is, allow the banks to, to steal people's money uh, if they get into trouble. Uh, we said, no, it's not in writing, it's not written yep. down in black and white, so we, put, we, we wrote the legislation. If it's not in the legislation, it's not worth anything. We wrote the legislation and Senator Roberts put that up and that was voted, that amendment was not passed, it was voted down. Now the vote was 32 to 12, but another way of looking at the vote in reality, Craig, was 2 to 2. The two major parties teamed up to vote down the two minor parties. One Nation and the Greens voted together for the clarification. The two major parties voted against the people of Australia for the banks, basically. Right? Um, and that's more important because it doesn't matter that they had the overwhelming numbers. They're the major parties. They can always muster the numbers if they join together. The question is, you could, the viewer has to ask himself, is why would the major parties side together on something? And I'll tell you what, if you want a, a rule of thumb of where to look for bad stuff in Australian politics, look for the bipartisan things. And it's usually to do with banks, and it's especially used to do the foreign policy, right? Those are the things that they don't question each other on. There's a lot of evil hidden behind that bipartisanship. And this was another example. Now, that said, um, this is actually not a defeat, right? Because at first, like I said, it was a you know, milestone even having the, the debate. But what we can report is there was a last minute rebellion on the government side in, among government backbenchers um, some threatened across the floor, and that led to a, an ongoing negotiation process. So now Senator Malcolm Roberts has um, reported on, his, on Twitter and on his website that he's in an ongoing negotiation with the government to resolve this issue one way or another. So we don't know how that's played out yet or how it will play out. We will monitor it closely and, and um, report back. But the bail-in issue... The fight to uh, stop bail-in in Australia is not defeated. That's what we can report here. That's right. But more positively, what we can also report much more significantly is the fight to kill the cash ban law is won. We have defeated it. And that happened yesterday. And this is as clear-cut a victory as you'll get. But let me say, um, I hope a lot of the viewers can remember that we'll, we'll, we'll recap the campaign we went on. But I want to play... How this bill, the, remember the bill is to, was a, for a law to ban cash transactions over $10,000, right? We called it the cash ban law. It ended not with a bang, but with a whimper. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 899 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Roberts. I move the motion. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The eyes have it. So that was it, Craig. Over. Gone. Right? Yep. They, didn't, they didn't even go to a division in, in the parliament. Um, when, 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 the, when the president says any opposed, no one says anything, that's it. 
yeah. right? And ironically, that's how, the, that's how Bail-In passed originally in, in 2018. Yeah. So what we want to do is spend a few minutes reminding people how this came about, because this is an enormous victory for people power. Right. Well, it's really important that people realise that as we go through this history is that most people get very cynical about politics in Australia. Yep. It's a two-party system. And the two major parties are very happy to say, no, you don't have to do anything, just leave it to us. Yep. And look at the mess that gets created. Look at the interests, the, the vested interests, the banks, and how they tread over the ordinary person and how they destroy the concept of anything to do with the common good. That is, the role of government is there to support, to govern for the entirety of the people, not just an elite clique. Right, so the point is when we go through this history, if, it doesn't matter what people have done, how much or how little. The fact is they did something. Yes. They got off the centre ground and they went and talked to their Member of Parliament, they sent emails, they sent submissions, they did something. And that action, Robbie, that freaks the hell out of the politicians. Absolutely. Because this is not what's, not, not what's supposed to happen. You're not supposed to be questioned. Yeah. And anyway, you should lay it out a bit more for people and go well, back because it's well, absolutely stunning. <laughs> No, exactly. Why don't we take a break and in the next segment we will go through the history of this, how we achieved this victory. Welcome back to the Citizens Report where we're discussing victory for people power in the war on cash. So now we're going to go through how we achieved the victory where yesterday on the um, 3rd of December in Parliament, Senator Malcolm Roberts moved a motion that the major parties did not oppose to get rid of the cash ban bill. It's now dead, 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 as the Sydney Morning Herald um, headline says, you can see that on the screen. This is a victory for people power, but I want to qualify that, Craig. People power, I'm not talking about a mob, right? I'm not talking about, this, that, that's not what happened here. This was informed, engaged citizens, right? And they made sure they were informed and they got engaged. We played a leadership role in showing them what to do, but the public um, rose to the occasion here, right? Not just beating their chest, actually getting on top of the details and staying engaged with the, with the members of parliament. Now, because I fear I might forget it at the end, I just want to go through some acknowledgements right now and then we'll, then we'll recap. The first person I want to acknowledge is Helen Edwards. Helen Edwards is a, an anti-money laundering campaigner in Australia who was a victim of, of a money laundering scam herself. She became a, a campaigner. Um, Helen Edwards is the first Australian to know about this bill because it was released late on a Friday afternoon back in July uh, 2019. And, no, and, and the reason the government did that, and they released it for a two-week consultation for Treasury, and the reason they did that was so that no one would know about it, right? Um, a contact of Helen's was a, in a, in a, an official in, in Tunisia, saw it online and just told Helen about it, sent her a message, Helen notified the economist John Adams. John Adams notified us, and we launched a campaign, right? And, and um, I got to interview Helen over this, so I want to acknowledge Helen. John Adams and Martin North were our um, allies in this fight. Now, that's and a, there's a funny story there, Robbie, because you and I know that back in August of 2019, we were sitting in a restaurant in, in Brisbane, and when this, when, uh, you know, when this uh, announcement came up about the cash ban, John said, oh, it's well, when, when, sorry, to be specific, when, when, the, when the Labor Party announced that that's they were right. going to support sorry. it. When the Labor Party announced that the, you know, they were going to support the bill, John said, that's it, it's all finished. You know, and he was pretty adamant about it. And he said, look, John, we haven't even started fighting yet. And that's when we get really went on the front foot with this campaign and mobilised the, the thousands upon exactly. thousands of people. And the lesson from that is not that John was wrong, but um, in that sense, he was looking at the way politics normally works. When Labor sides with the Liberals, that's law, right? But what, but what um, nobody could foresee then, we knew we were going to try and make it happen, was how much um, we would get the public engaged in this. And that changed everything. And you have to right? understand, Robbie, this was informed by our long-term campaign on bail-in, you know, back yep. starting in 2013. What we've done on bail-in is absolutely, uh, it could be a magnitude greater than what we've done on the cash ban. Well, well, uh, so to be specific, John Adams and Martin North had, had done a, a, on their Interest of the People show, they had forecast there would be action on the cash ban front um, months earlier. Um, and John, had, John was the person to um, raise the issue that cash bans were necessary for central banks to make negative interest rates work. Um, and, and so they went big on their show to campaign against it and they got massive views on their show. I got interviewed with, on Martin on his other show called Walk the World 
and there's about nearly 170,000 views on that particular interview on the cash ban. And that's way beyond what we normally get because this got people's attention, right? Um, and so we, between them and us and others, we were able to use YouTube, like we're doing now, to great effect to spread the word, and we spread it through every other way we could. Um, a lot of other YouTube channels jumped in, Craig. So they include Nuggets News and others in the Bitcoin community like um, Adam Stokes. They include Heisa Says in Brisbane. Um, uh, one of the organisations that, that joined in was the Taxpayers Alliance. The other people, uh, you, you need to acknowledge One Nation members of Parliament, um, Pauline Hanson and, and Malcolm Roberts, and Bob Catter, because um, no other members of Parliament spoke out against this law until they did. And when they did, that's, what, that's when the first media, mainstream media coverage came on about this law. And when that happened, then a lot more people got to um, uh, hear about it. And then you've got to acknowledge the thousands of people who made calls, right, and sent and made submissions. They did an incredible job. I want to, I want to single out two individuals who made an extraordinary contribution with, of actual um, informed evidence. And they are Paul Wins from South Australia, who revealed to that the, um, the existence of these black economy reports from that the IMF had, had printed, had published, that showed that the government's excuse that a cash ban was necessary to combat the black economy, which means tax evasion and money laundering, right? These, these proper international studies had shown that's garbage. Cash restrictions do not work in doing that. And that Paul Wins contributed that. I know in Parliament that was incredibly effective in getting in persuading members of Parliament. Melissa Harrison, who's an independent researcher in Western Australia who works with us now, Melissa did the study of the Black Economy Task Force report here that KPMG did, and she showed how, in their own words, that they had this utopian um, ideal that they were going to use this cash ban to, to turn Australia into a financial surveillance state, right? Where they where they could monitor and measure your activities because you had to do everything through the banks, right? And that was Melissa's contribution. And these were incredibly important. And then Finally, two other politicians that have to be acknowledged is Labor Senator Alex Gallagher, who did an incredible job, um, along with the, another South Australian Senator, Rex Patrick, in the first hearing on this law. And, what, in, and that hearing showed up the government to be the emperor with no clothes because the Treasury, ATO, um, uh, Reserve Bank and Austrac had no evidence. Gallagher asked them all day, where's your evidence for this? law that this will work, that this is necessary, and they had none. Mm. And that changed the game, that, that hearing. But how did we get about it? So let's just go through quickly. I've, I've got a bit of a timeline here. Um, so as we said, we got wind of it late July. There was two weeks, two weeks to make um, submissions right to this Treasury consultation. Two years earlier, Craig, and an equivalent thing, when we first got wind of bail-in similarly, and we had two weeks to make submissions to Treasury then on its consultation, we generated 250 submissions. And at the time, we were quite impressed because we compared that to what Treasury normally got in the consultation process, and it was about 30. Mm -hmm. So a normal, normal Treasury consultation was 30. We generated 250 back in 2017. In 2019 on cash ban, the same thing in two weeks, 3,620 submissions. It blew every record ever in the Australian Parliament on this kind of thing. It blew the socks off them, right? That was the... That was the first evidence, hey, this is what the public really thinks about this. Those, those submissions were incredible. Um, then that led to, yes, Labor said, oh, we're going to support it. So we said, call Labor senators, call Labor members of parliament. And there was a flood of calls. And under those flood of calls, Labor shifted and said, oh, OK, we agree there should be an inquiry first before we waive this through parliament. Because they were in, it would have been waived through parliament in September 2019 and become law on the 1st of January 2020. That was the plan. Right? And it was the calls and the submissions that stopped that. Then when we got the inquiry, that led to those hearings, like I said. And when those hearings were held, that was an absolute game changer. Um, uh, the hearings forced all the members of parliament to take stock and say, what is this? Right? And then under repeated calls from the public, the Senate inquiry came up with a report that said, OK, there has to be all these changes. And the changes were demanded by liberals on their own bill, right? And it effectively would have made the law unworkable. And at that point, which is around February this year, COVID hit and the government changed the subject. And they basically quietly sidelined this bill and said, oh, we'll just keep it over there and you know, not say anything about it, hope it died a quiet death. But One Nation 
um, to their credit, was suspicious to make sure, no, no, you're not going to play a trick on the public here and just suddenly spring this on them one day, right, because you do a dirty deal with the, with the Labor Party. And that's why they moved the motion this week and said, what's the, what's, what are you going to do? Here's a motion to get this out of Parliament. Are you going to support it or not? And what that clip I showed you before was their declaration of surrender. Okay, we surrender, it's over, right? But it was the extraordinary, intense, sustained effort of the Australian public that did this. And what we want to say now, because we're, we're going to take a break and talk about a different subject quickly, is we need to use, learn the lesson from that. Don't give up. Don't think because you have a vote that fails like on Monday on the, on the bail-in that, oh, this now doesn't work. No, it does work, but you've got to sustain the effort. And when you do, then um, anything's possible. And we just saw that this week. So pat yourself on the back and, 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 um, and join us after the break for how we can use that effort to get positive outcomes like an Australia Post Bank. Welcome back to the Citizens Report. Finally, fight for the win-win solution in Australia Post Bank. Now, one way to think about what we're about to talk about, Craig, is when we talk about the cash ban and bail-in, these are, these are bad policies we're fighting against. We have a positive solution that can solve all those at the same time, all right? Actually achieve something positive that we should be fighting for. And it's, so it's a much bigger deal. And that's this idea of a national bank. And we're proposing a, 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 a tandem model of a national development bank that could do long-term investments for Australia, but a retail side of an Australia Post Bank that provides retail services and forces the private banks to compete. Robbie, let me ask the question to our viewers. Do they want to see Australia Post privatised? Because that, this is the game that's underfoot now. Yeah. This is why you know, Christine Hol, uh, Holgate's been sidelined as an, an exceptionally effective CEO, someone that actually took the time to really understand the business of Australia Post, which is not, it's a government owned or, or, uh, corporation, but it doesn't operate under taxpayers' money, which no. pe most people have to understand. This is not, it's a, it's a government corporation, they operate differently. But the point is, the intention, as with the Liberal, the Liberal Party policies in the yep. past, is if it looks good, if it's profitable, flog it. Yep. And that's what's happening with this, this whole program with Australia Post. So the question is for the, for the viewer is, do you want Australia Post sold off in your area? Do you want it privatised? And, and I think that's, this is the, nature, the, 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 the large game. That's and talking. what she showed through the way she managed Australia Post is it could make a profit, but it could make a profit in this modern way of cross-subsidising the delivery of the post with financial services, right? And this is what... This happens around the world with postal banks and it's become the new model um, and it could happen here. And she made it work here. And what we're proposing is you could, you could make that a permanent arrangement, but not just through providing financial services for private banks, through a public bank. And this is, it's a win-win solution. What does it do? It secures deposits, no bail-ins, no. right? You, you put your money there, your deposit's secure, not even up to 250,000, fully. Um, Guarantees services. You can't be debanked. This is can't discriminate, right? It will have to provide services for everybody. It's an alternative to the banking oligopoly that will force them to compete, which is something they don't do. The oligopoly is this the big four that you know it's it's a it's a it's a it's a cartel effectively, right? Um, this will force them to compete. It can maintain the cash payment system. Because the private banks want to get a, want to get rid of cash. They want everyone to do electronic transactions through their fancy software. Right, and those people who know that, yeah, you you, can, you might talk young people into doing that because they accept everything done on the internet. But you, there's so many benefits to cash, even the fact that you're never caught stranded when the power goes out for crying out loud. Right, really basic stuff. That's what an Australia Post can do because it won't be motivated to get rid of cash, um, and it'll provide financial services, especially for rural and regional communities, Craig, which is a big, big deal. Huge, right, yeah. there are there's 55 percent of Australian communities that don't have any kind of financial services, a bank or even an ATM. 1,600 of those are in rural and regional Australia, right? Australia Post, by law, has to, has to maintain 2,500 branches, post offices in rural and regional Australia. 2,500. 2,300 of them are these licensed post offices that are run as small businesses, right? Those small businesses are the biggest stakeholder in Australia Post. And you'll, we'll show you a clip on that um, in a minute. Um, so... And Australia Post Bank sustains all that. It makes Australia Post viable 
ongoing, no need to privatise it, right? And Christine Holgate proved that in what she did. And that's why she was absolutely slaughtered though, right? Mm. Where um, another, she did a deal with the banks, made them pay $200 million, that was a total deal, $200 million they, they coughed up to cover their, fi providing financial service to their customers. And extra, that overall was 220 because 20 million of that was GST. So 20 million of the deal went to the taxpayer and she was slaughtered by a combined effort of Labor's Kibbilly Kitching and, and um, uh, Scott Morrison, who accused her of spending taxpayers' money because she spent $20,000 rewarding the executives who did the deal. Robbie, the hypocrisy. Scott Morrison has just been, it's just been found out. Scott Morrison used the government jet to, to fly exactly. to Lachlan Mur Murdoch's birthday party, $5,000. I was appalled. It's disgraceful. That's an example yep. of the hypocrisy of this government. Craig, I want to lay out just the, the, there is a there is already enormous support for this idea, but it's but it's it's um it's split up, it's divided and conquered in a sense. We've got to we've got to muster it, we've got to marshal it and get it all on the same page. All the crossbenchers in the in the Australian Parliament support it. Half the Labor Party supports it because the unions support it. The National Party actually supports it, right? Because they know how important these regional post offices are, and there's backbenchers and liberals that support it. We're going to we're running a big campaign now to make this happen. There's three parts of the campaign. We need to sack the current board that stabbed Pauline he Christine Holgate in the back, bring back Christine Holgate as CEO, and turn Australia Post into a bank. And we've written we're writing legislation for that that Bob Catter will introduce into Parliament. But the Nationals are already getting the, the message. I want to play a clip now of two days ago in Parliament. Barnaby Joyce stood up. And now remember what happened to Christine Holgate. She was slaughtered by his government. He stood up and said this. Uh, John Maynard Keynes said that when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? Well, I tell you what, I'm going to change my mind on my previous statements about Christine Holgate. I think I was pulling the, the wrong way. I don't think she's a bad person. I think she actually did a really good job. And I'll tell you why, Mr Deputy Speaker, because I've been speaking to some of the country post offices and they said if it wasn't for Christine Holgate, they'd be broke. She was the one who actually managed to carve out a deal from the banks so that they got paid a fair amount is what actually kept their businesses going. And we've got to make sure that we don't have these country post offices bundled up, cut up and sold off so that we don't have postal services in regional areas. And we've got to be really careful we don't fall into the trap of the pylon Christine Brigade because that's not where the real game is. The real game is making sure that we keep these post offices open. And I'll tell you why. Because the average investment by those people in those post offices is about $1.1 million per investment. These are why these mums and dads are a bit concerned about losing Christine Holgate. In many of these communities, you don't have uh, street deliveries. If you didn't have a post office, you don't get the mail. And what they're worried about is that there's a Boston Consulting Group report. We haven't seen it. The Boston Consulting Group report, we believe, is going to say sell the post offices off. And what we're going to say in regional areas is how on earth do we now get the mail? So, Craig, it's not very often you get a mere culpa where a politician gets up and says, I was wrong. And this is the beginning of a major campaign from us, Robbie. Um, we've got the petition that's this needs to, everyone needs to get signed and also our, uh, our flyers. Yeah, that's right. Here. A new petition. We'll put the link below. Please sign it. Share it around. Um, we've got a flyer we want you to take to everywhere, including to your local post office. Yeah. right? And you can, you can call and order those. Um, what we've covered today, you can find in our Australian Alert Service, right, which is our weekly publication. If you haven't already received a copy, call it and you can get a free one. Um, but join the fight for this. We can win positive policies as well as we can defeat bad ones. Absolutely. Craig, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Thanks to the viewers. See you next week.